Chapter 7 Attraction Like unto like doth the universe cry, Without choose to accept thou wilt see. Skim the wide ocean, split the deep sky, Relentlessly bound on a meeting with thee. The Endless Prayer The human being is a center of life force, Attracting some things, repelling others according to his conceptions and beliefs. Universal mind differentiates into centers of life force, or atoms, which congregate with others vibrating on a similar frequency. And it is the nature of any unit built from universal mind to attract onto itself those thought things that answer the mental vibrations it exudes. We have seen that all the things of our world are nothing more or less than pure intelligence, cast into form by a consertion in the universal subconscious mind. Intelligence responds to intelligence, and thought creates vibrations which inevitably attract the thing in the image. The one mind in which we all live contains an infinite number of possibilities all of which are capable of becoming manifest in space and time when the conception has been planted in universal subconscious mind. Therefore, whatever you choose and accept must develop in your experience, for it is attracted to you by an irresistible and immutable law, a law which isn't working some of the time, or occasionally, or most of the time, but every second of every minute of all the time there is. Whether we like analogy or not, we are literally praying every minute of our lives, and every single one of our prayers is answered. There is no escaping this wheel of answered thought and belief. It is the law of life. Whatever has developed in our experience has not been brought to us by luck or fate or coincidence but is simply a physical manifestation of our thought and belief. Whether it has brought us good or evil, it is, in effect, an answered prayer. Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote, And though thy knees were never bent, to heaven thy hourly prayers are sent, and whether, formed for good or ill, are registered and answered still. You are what you think. You attract what you think. Your life is a product of your thought and belief. And nothing in the world can change this fact. To alter your life, the only single course open is to alter your thinking. The Primal Force Since the shepherds of Asia Minor thousands of years ago discovered that the iron crooks of their wooden staffs were attracted to certain hard black stones, lodestones, the world of science increasingly has come to understand that behind all form and substance in the universe is a subtle but powerful attraction. This attraction manifests a high order of design and intelligence, and science has chosen to call it the laws of nature, while religion has chosen to call it God. We, for the purposes of new definition, call it the universal subconscious mind, Studying the lines of force of a magnet, science has discovered that these lines never cross. They either repel or attract one or the other. No matter how far a magnet is displaced from the lines of force in a free field, it will always return to its point of balance. So it is with the mind that sets up certain patterns of thought. Everything contrary to this thought is automatically repelled. Everything allied to this thought is automatically attracted. No matter how far such a mind is displaced from those things which it seeks, it will return to them as it must. For example, such a mind as has built up habits of thinking aimed at poverty or lack must inevitably create such a physical situation, no matter how much prosperity it is thrust into. If the owner of such a mind suddenly finds himself with a hundred thousand dollars, he will shortly be dispossessed of it and return to a state of want, directed there by the thought habits of his mind and what they are attracting for him. 
It is never money makes success. It is the thinking of the man. A conditioned habit of prosperity thinking is usually ingrained on the mind of a person who is born to wealth and plenty. This habit of positive thinking in regard to money is as much a part of him as the negation of money a part of the thinking one who is born to poverty. As a consequence, those who are born to wealth seem to attract further wealth to themselves effortlessly. But it is not the money that accomplishes this. It is the pattern of thinking. Similarly, those born to poverty must exercise the greatest industry and perseverance before wealth smiles on them, for they must gradually condition their minds to think positively of money before money will be manifested. Each small success that comes their way contributes to building favorable thought patterns of confidence and faith, and so they finally achieve success and prosperity through being able to think right. The subtle but irrevocable fact is this. Those things that a conscious organism believes are always returned by the universal subconscious mind. Attraction is everywhere. The proton, vibrating in pure intelligence, attracts to it electrons of such frequency and number as to form an atom of a particular atomic weight. Hydrogen, oxygen, iron, gold, uranium. The very earth itself exudes a magnetism that steadies the needles of compasses at sea and delicately counterbalance the centrifugal force of the earth's path around the sun. Dynamic attraction is everywhere present in the universe. Call it what you will. Magnetism, polarity, electricity, thought power, moving intelligence. It is everywhere. Attraction. Like unto like. The thing to the image. The circumstance to the vision. The answer to the prayer. On this law and this law alone are all things constructed from the atom to the solar system. A magnet may attract iron and have no effect on aluminum. And you yourself may attract disease and repel health. But there ends the comparison between physical and mental law. For the magnet by itself cannot change its properties of attraction and repulsion, while you, by changing your thought and belief, can set up an entirely new field of magnetism and attract those very things you were repelling before. Thus, by refusing to accept ill health and attaching your beliefs to the perfectness of spirit, you may banish disease from your experience. Stepping Stone to the Stars Jesus spoke of the law of attraction and the habit patterns of the conscious mind when he said, Unto him who hath shall be given. Unto him who hath not shall be taken away, even that which he hath. He knew that the image and faith of the conscious mind was always materialized by the Father. He knew that a person who saw abundance around him was by that very act calling into existence even more abundance. And he knew that a person who saw lack all about him was by that very act calling into existence an even greater lack. As you believe, so shall it be done unto you, he said. And in this simple sentence, he stated the law of attraction more truly and concisely than it is ever likely to be stated again. Every thought you entertain and accept becomes a part of you and inevitably will bring you the physical reality of your image. All choice is made in the mind and all acceptance is made by the Spirit. And there are not billions of minds in this world at all, but only one, and it is in every one of us. It is sheer vanity to bemoan your fate for having been born into lack and limitation and disease, while some other person has been born into abundance and health, and is, as a consequence, scarcely touched by evil. When you truly have come to understand that there is only one mind, which is every place at the same time and is in all things, you will know that the differences between you and any person on earth are purely illusory. Your eye may have known lack and limitation, 
But when you cast these negations out and take on the knowledge of abundance and health, your eye has changed, and you are no longer the same person. True, you still occupy the same body, but even as your surroundings will simply change, so your body will become vigorous and unafraid, erect and purposeful, animated by the greatest power in the universe. You can be anything you want to be, do anything you want to do. Born high or born low makes not the slightest difference. Exposed to the various evil in the world, you may use it as a stepping stone to the stars. For the kingdom of God is within, and all the power of the mighty universal subconscious mind awaits your choice and your belief. No more is given to kings than to beggars. We are all born equal, for we are all one. And he who disputes this point suffers from vanity. And vanity kills quicker than the hemlock of Socrates. Vanity the Killer It is vanity, isolated ego, which is always our undoing. It's, I have to do this, I have to do that. I, 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 when the truth is that I does nothing but choose and accept, and all things are done by the universal subconscious mind. Popular opinion to the contrary, vanity is more likely to be found among the failures and the diseased and the poverty-stricken than it is among the successful and healthy, for vanity is no more nor less than a sense of personal responsibility, an acute sense of ego, as being separate and isolated from the universal subconscious mind. A person who falls prey to disease believes that he must take constant precautions against the invisible microbes which are constantly threatening him. He believes that the whole matter of his being, free from ailments, depends on his taking the proper physical precautions at the proper times, and the ritual with which he calls forth the god of health is contained in bottles and boxes of powders, liquids, and nostrums. It is true that very often these medicaments produce the desired result, for the very obvious reason that the person taking them believes they will. If he in the first place would simply have faith in the perfect spirit that has made his body manifest, he would let go of his sense of personal responsibility invoke the power of the subconscious for physical vigor, and never fall prey to disease at all. The Evil of Isolation It is the same with failure. A man who sets out to achieve anything on the basis that it is all up to him will shortly be engulfed by myriad problems and decisions. No man alone is big enough to do anything. He didn't put himself upon this earth. He cannot save himself from departing. All the ingenuity of science cannot make so much as a single blade of grass. As long as a man carries with him a sense of having to do anything all by himself, he will inevitably fail at what he attempts to do. But when he lets go of his vanity, seizes unity with all life and all things, rejects personal isolation, then he invites the great power into his life, and all things are arranged according to the good he desires. Vanity is an acute sense of separateness. Vanity causes us to see all things and all people as obstacles in our path. Vanity would have us believe that all things are arranged in the physical world rather than on the plane of infinite mind. It draws us in. It closes us up. It causes us to lend reality to evil and negative circumstance. It gives birth to resentment, to belligerence, to hate, and even to violence. How silly and even stupid it is, yet how difficult to abolish. The two ends of life are equalizers. Into life we enter naked, and naked we depart. Yet the majority of us, Act as if the most important thing in all life is to get the best of our neighbors. Better clothes, better cars, better jobs. We frustrate ourselves with our isolated egos and spill out our energies on the relentless blade of competition. We set out to deal with the world as if it were an enemy aimed at thwarting us. 
and the world turns out to be exactly what we conceive it to be, as it always must. The more opposition we see, the more frantic we become, hung on the endless wheel of our own thoughts and conceptions. In Ecclesiastics, we find the remarkable quotation, Vanities of vanities, all is vanity. The writer of this most astute metaphysical observation knew that man's gravest error was concerned with isolating himself from God or the universal subconscious mind in which all things have their being and which and in and in which all power is contained. So sad it is to see vanity in the high places or the low, for vanity preludes disaster as pride goeth before a fall. Acknowledging the Senior Partner The successful and vigorous person cannot be vain. If he becomes so, he is shortly reduced to failure and lethargy. A man sometimes repeatedly climbs the heights only to fall again to the bottom with a resounding crash. But each time, he seems buoyed to the top by a stroke of luck. And each time that he arrives at the top, he chortles. I did it all by myself. What a great man am I. And down he comes again. Humility regained and the subconscious again allowed to enter his life. He once more begins the ascent through another set of fortunate circumstances. Some men have ridden this whirly gig eight or nine times and still are no wiser for it. Vanity is a sin so close to the human heart. This you can rest assured of. The really great and outstanding people of our world have a constant partner, God, or the subconscious mind, whichever you will. And this partner is consulted on all matters and is acknowledged to be the doer of all their deeds. They, like Jesus, attune themselves to all the power of creation when they acknowledge, It is not I who doeth the works, but the Father who dwelleth within me. Let go and let God. Overcoming vanity and relaxing into mental attitudes of trust and confidence often have been expressed in the metaphysical saying, Let go and let God. Yet it would seem from observation of many who quote this saying that they haven't absorbed it. On the one hand, they say, I trust in God. And on the other, they act as if God were quite untrustworthy. They set out for certain goals, create the attainment of these goals on the plane of mind, and accept the image. But the very first time they observe that the path they are following doesn't coincide with the route they believe they should take, they are convinced that God has made a mistake or hasn't heard them in the first place. I'm not going to get there, is their first reaction. And naturally the subconscious mind then sees to it that they don't. You can't predict the subconscious mind, and you can't outguess the subconscious mind. And if you try, you defeat those very things you have set out to do. It is strange that any of us ever try to tell God how to do things in the first place, since most of us will readily admit that we don't know everything. The subconscious mind always works with the perfect knowledge of all times and all places, and all people and all things. It must answer billions of different conceptions. Only God knows the way a thing may be done. And man never will, not until his evolution has brought him complete unity with the universal subconscious mind. But whatever you conceive and accept with faith will be yours, regardless of the apparently circuitous paths and byroads you must follow to its attainment. The road you are guided to take is the only way. There is no other. And as long as you work with the subconscious mind, your steps and routes are perfect. Trust the all-knowing mind. Each of us embarks on life's projects, like a man who stands in front of a forest and desires to go through to a lake on the other side. Before the man starts, he hasn't the slightest idea which trees he will pass on the left and which trees he will pass on the right. He cannot foresee the culvert he will meet, or the monkey lowland, or the creek that 
must be forded. He sees in his mind only a straight line leading from his side of the forest to the lake, and along this line he starts as the shortest distance between two points. A tree lies fallen across his path. He skirts it. He comes to the swamp. He walks around it. He comes to the culvert and again swings off his straight route to avoid an obstacle. Does he become discouraged each time he must vary from the straight line which he has projected as the shortest route to the lake? If he does, he will say, I can't get there. And the subconscious mind will turn him around and march him back to his starting point, and he will have failed. But the subconscious mind won't have failed. It will have answered his most recent conviction, as it always must. The man who says, I can't, is a failure and unhappy, but he nevertheless arrives back at his starting place unharmed, guided to return there by the subconscious mind. It is the man who cuts himself off from God, the man whose vanity isolates him from the subconscious mind, who is in the real danger. He says, God made a mistake and doesn't know how to do this because I know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. Therefore, I will climb over the fallen tree and proceed on my way. He does, and the tree is rotten and collapses on him, and the fall breaks his leg. Or if he safely passes the tree and proceeds through the swamp, he is caught in the quicksand. Or if he passes the tree and the swamp and walks through the culvert, he is bitten by a rattlesnake. Thus, the man, who predicts the way the subconscious mind must work, is never following anything other than his own dictates, which will surely visit limitation and lack and even disaster upon him finally. For our traveler by himself cannot know of the rotten tree and the quicksand and the rattlesnake. But God does. He who conceives his goal with faith and never falters no matter the bends in the road will surely arrive at his destination and always by the most perfect path. The Invincible Guide From the 23rd Psalm Lo, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. God is wherever you are always guiding you. He forever guides you to each of your conceptions, for he answers in physical reality that which you conceive and accept in your mind. If you conceive and accept good, you will be guided along the most perfect path to its attainment, no matter how winding and circuitous the route may seem to your limited knowledge. Thus, let go and let means to trust God to trust in the perfect knowledge of the subconscious mind, to know whatever paths you travel toward, your goals are the right ones, the only ones, the perfect ones, for you have been set upon them by the omnipotent mind of God, which makes no mistakes and will deliver you safely and prepared at your destination. Let go and let God means to recognize that you do nothing but observe and accept, and whatever you accept is delivered to you by the subconscious mind. There is no personal responsibility for anything but thought, for accepted thoughts become manifest in the physical world. Away with vanity and guilt. Cast aside your vanity. You do nothing by yourself, and you are never alone. All things are done by the universal subconscious mind which is always right where you are. You are not isolated from the world. You are a part of it and at the same time, the whole of it. The world is your friend if you are friendly with yourself. If you make it your enemy, you fight only yourself. Be humble in the fact of accomplishment, for you do nothing but conceive and accept it. God does everything. He writes all the books, paints all the pictures, builds all the bridges. His instruments are those who attune themselves to his presence and allow the power to flow through. Cast aside your guilt, 
who does not make mistakes. Do not feel guilty for mistakes and thought and subsequently indeed, for it is this path man must travel to become one with God. Guilt has no place in life. Mistakes are for learning. Guilt holds on to mistakes and makes them happen again. Guilt isolates you from the subconscious mind. Guilt brings about vanity, the vanity of being alone without God. Vanity and guilt are the destroyers of attunement, heirs of growing self-consciousness, creators of illusion and evil. Feel your unity with all things and all life, and you will see vanity slip away. Know only the eternal now of the subconscious mind. No past, no future, only a present that is always existing, and you will feel guilt dissolve. God is in you, has done what you have done, and God does not chastise himself nor destroy himself. Be born anew in the words of Emerson. On this altar God has built, I lay my vanity and guilt. Be done with it. Shame and remorse are poisonous weeds to plant in the subconscious, and vanity isolates you from the power of the subconscious mind. Be alert for these harbingers of evil. Allow them to enter your life no more. God knows how. The law of attraction is the law of the manifestation of beliefs and desires. And the method by which this law may be controlled so as to produce only good is by refusing to accept evil. When you have envisaged a goal and created its attainment on the plane of mind, nothing can stop you from realizing that goal but the creation of your failure on the plane of mind. You may run into setbacks, into circumstances that appear to be preventing you from arriving at your destination. But these are not setbacks at all. They are steps forward. In fact, they are the only steps forward possible for you to make and still arrive at your goal. Since you don't know as much as the subconscious mind, you cannot predict the path by which it will take you to your destination. In your limited knowledge of the things and circumstances and motives of the world, you may have decided that in order to arrive at your destination, it is necessary for you to take a certain step at a certain time at a certain place. When the truth is that such a step actually taken would result in disaster. When you are frustrated in taking this step, you visualize the defeat of your plans and come to believe that evil has been visited on you instead of good. Thus, you lose your trust in God, in the universal subconscious mind, and the immutable laws of the universe. You start thinking defeat and evil, with the result that they inevitably will be visited upon you. There is absolutely only one way to make the law work in your favor, and that is to trust it completely and not predict it. In every obstacle, opportunity. The moment you start predicting the path you should take toward any goal, you will find your faith challenged at every fork in the road, at every bypath, at every apparent obstacle. But when you have learned to trust the law completely, you will begin to see every delay and every obstacle as opportunities whereby you may become fit and ready for what awaits you when you arrive at your destination. For example, a young man decides to become an engineer. Were he to be given the job of building a bridge the next day, he would fail miserably. But as long as he holds his image and desire and faith clearly, the subconscious mind will deliver him fit and ready for his appointment with bridge building. In the interim, there may be five or six years of engineering education perhaps several jobs in which he fully masters his science. And lo, the day arrives when the assignment is his and he is outfitted with the tools to conquer it. And every step of the way he has been in the hands of the omnipotent and omniscient subconscious mind. 
There is no such thing as failure unless it is accepted. There is no such thing as defeat unless it is accepted. There is no such thing as evil unless it is accepted. Let go of your feeling of personal responsibility and turn everything over to the universal subconscious mind. Don't predict the way this mind shall work. Accept your appointed task and circumstances with complete faith that they will provide the perfect path to the attainment of your desires. Evil and failure and defeat and disease cannot touch you if you will refuse to accept them. Only what you accept comes to you finally. All else is but temporary and merely a step to your goal. Such is the law of attraction, a law that never fails. One more warning. Do not keep examining your goal to see if you have attained it. A watched pot never boils, for the simple reason that you are watching it when it isn't boiling, and this is the thought that you project into the subconscious mind. Rest assured of the eventual accomplishment of your goal and take pleasure and wisdom from each experience along the way. If life were only moments of victory, it would be very short indeed. Learn to enjoy the journey. Triumph over Circumstance A middle-aged man in a Midwestern city resigned a secure job and invested his life savings in a small manufacturing plant. Shortly afterward, the aircraft parts for which his machinery had been designed became obsolete. There seemed no alternative other than to close his doors and face the loss of his investment. Oh, but I was bitter, he said. I felt the whole world was an injustice. Then one morning I read three words. Nothing is wasted. I went down to the plant alone. It was quiet inside and I wandered around. I picked up one of the gadgets we had been making, and it seemed different, as if I had never seen it before. It would make a terrific toy, I thought. Immediately I was certain of it. I rushed to the nearest phone and called my foreman. We worked all night on the plans. Next morning we gave them to a sales agency. Within two weeks we were in production. Believe me, I'll never accept defeat again. Today, his toy manufacturing business is worth more than a million dollars. A married woman with two school-aged children was near the verge of hysteria at the arrival of a third child. To think, she willed, that I've gone through eight years of diapers, formulas, inoculations, laundry, meals, cleaning, and babysitters, always looking forward to the day when the kids would be in school and I'd have some time of my own. Now I've got to go through it all over again. Not unless you want to, she was told. Of course I don't want to, she said. Then try this. Make up your mind that the greatest thing that ever happened to you was the birth of your third child. She was doubtful, but promised to give it a try. Before a year was out, her husband had made an astonishing success in his business and they were able to afford help in the house. She herself was successfully operating a small mail order business. She was playing golf once a week. She had just returned with her husband from a trip to Mexico City. She was brimming with enthusiasm and joy. What a tremendous lesson, she said. Now I know that everything depends on one's own attitude. The energetic business executive was disconsolate at being retired on his 65th birthday. He felt he had been put on the shelf, that life had no further use for him. He used his leisure only to brood. I've been scrapped, he complained. Life has passed me by. Not surprising, he was told. Life usually passes by those who suffer from PLOM. What's that? he asked. Poor little old me, was the answer. He scowled as if to take offense. Then he smiled. Is there a cure for it? he asked. Just quit feeling sorry for yourself. His chin jutted out, and the cure was affected that moment. 
Today, he and his wife have a busy stamp store and are so active in Philaetus societies that it no longer has time to brood. And how pleased he is to prescribe the never-failing cure for a severe case of PLOM. A young clerk was struck by a trolley car and lost the use of his legs. His family and friends were horrified, certain he would eventually become a ward of the state. Only a short time later, they were very surprised to find him operating a thriving advertising agency. However did you manage, they asked him. You can't even get out of bed. My mind can, he said. That's all that's necessary. Thought Atmosphere it is an inescapable fact that each human being who lives is surrounded by a subtle but powerful thought atmosphere. We are accustomed to believe that thoughts are invisible, yet we mark the existence of thousands of them with our very eyes each day. The thought of each man stands written on his face, on his brow, in the expression of his eyes, in the set of his lips, the carriage of his head his posture, his bearing, his demeanor, in the tone of his conversation, his character, his successes, his failures, his very life. Let a man walk into a room where you are, and you immediately are conscious of the thought atmosphere that surrounds him. The very first reaction is that you either like him or you don't. It isn't the man that prompts you to this instinctive decision. It is the kind of thoughts he thinks. His mental atmosphere reaches out and contacts yours immediately. If it is similar, you are attracted to him. If it is opposed, you dislike him. Only a modification of thinking on the part of one or both of you can change this. For like gravitates to like in the universal subconscious mind and throughout all nature. Each of us seeks for good to enter his life even when we become negative thinkers and hopeless and defeated. It is still good we seek. The reality we have lent to evil has brought us to the final imbecility of thinking negatively and hoping for the positive. Patterns of negative thinking seem our only means of coping with the world which appears bent on denying all our goals and aims and desires. These are our prompters the crosses we bear as we go through life. Karma, it is called by the Indian religions, that which would deny us the unlimited abundance and good of life, and it is sheer idiocy. The universal subconscious mind denies us nothing. Nature denies us nothing. We always get exactly what we have asked for. There is no lack, limitation, failure, or despair which we do not create for ourselves in our own minds. And it is just as simple, in fact downright simpler, to create abundance and success and health in our minds and thus experience them in the physical world. No limitation. There are no limitations for God. There is no lack in the universal subconscious mind. Whatever you dare ask for will be given, and you need only ask and have faith. Hast not thy share? On winged feet, lo, it rushes thee to meet. And all that nature made thy own floating in air and pent in stone will rive the hills and swim the sea, and like thy shadow follow thee, Emerson. The great lesson we all have to learn is to think only positively of good. For in the seeking good and thinking evil, we destroy our very lives on the sharp edge of the law of attraction and manifestation. Each negative thought that finds root in our acceptance brings upon us the very opposite of that which we seek. Frustration, illness, defeat, hopelessness, despair are all the result of our desiring good and thinking negatively for we have not the slightest chance of attaining good as long as we are creating evil with our thought. Thus it is that we have embarked upon the 30-day mental diet. Thus it is that you are advised today 
as Jesus advised so long ago. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all things will be added unto you. The Center of Consciousness The kingdom of heaven is the center of consciousness. The kingdom of heaven is that place of utter calm and serenity within the depths of your soul, where your eye becomes fused with the immortal eye of all creation. It is the place where you no longer are the doer, but instead become fused with the observer, the great contemplator, at the place where there is naught for you to do but choose and accept, where whatever is so chosen and so accepted becomes manifest in the physical world about you. Communion with your center of consciousness, the practice of the meditations, the 30-day mental diet will provide the tools with which you may banish negative thinking from your mind forever. Through these tools, you will build strong habits of positive thinking that will be your bulwark against every negative circumstance that crosses your path. And negative circumstance will cross your path. That is, circumstances that appear to be negative will cross your path. They will appear to be negative for they will be detours from the path which you have projected for yourself, but they actually will be perfect steps toward your goal in the infinite wisdom of the universal subconscious mind. It is only when you accept them as evil that they become evil. Otherwise, they are but temporary and dissolve immediately when they are refused the impetus of conviction. Habits of positive thinking, firmly ingrained, strongly built, will sustain you no matter the height of the seas, the strength of the tempest, or the fury of the storm. Peace, be still, will be your order, and the seas will abate in the face of your faith. Lowly faithful, banish fear. Right Onward drive unharmed. The port well worth the cruise is near, and every wave is charmed. Emerson Know your center of consciousness. Retreat into it in your time of meditation until you know. Here is the place where all things in this world and the next are done, and once having arrived at it, there can be no terror or fear or disquiet for you ever again. Remember, the center of consciousness, the kingdom of heaven, is the place where you become the observer, where even thoughts are things to be observed. It is a place of complete calm and quiet, a place of absolute sureness, a place of communion with the universal subconscious mind. First Cause We have said a good deal about all first causes being mental and everything being first created on the plane of the mind. We have said that each of us has no responsibility other than for his thoughts and his beliefs. And so the modern-day Sadducees and Pharisees come to us and say, Man is a builder and doer with his hands, and it is falsehood to say that man can achieve by taking thought or perhaps you have confided to a friend that in your meditations you are treating yourself for some particular goal, and your friend has said, What foolishness! If you are after what you say you are, then quit mooning around with the mumbo-jumbo and get out and get it. And many a man on the right track has been led off the path by such false counsel. Nobody achieves anything by going out and getting it. The very premise insinuates at the outset that he believes whatever he is after belongs to somebody else, and he has to take it away. When a man has created on the plane of mind the conviction that whatever he is after is already is, he will be guided in the proper path and in the proper action that will achieve his goal. Action of itself produces nothing. There is true action, and there is false action, and false action will not move a mole hill, while true action will dissolve a mountain. True action is neither more nor less 
than true thought. For action follows thought. If your thought is true, your action will be impeccably guided by the subconscious mind. How to use your will We have previously raised cautions against willing things to happen on the premise that will is usually directed at overcoming physical obstacles and circumstances which may very well be part of a perfect plan by which universal mind is guiding you to your destination. The danger of exercising will to attain specific things is that of isolating yourself from the power for good which you have invoked. On the one hand, you have called upon the power with faith and conviction. On the other, by the exercise of will, you may easily deny it or set it to working in another direction. Consequently, all effort should be aimed at attunement with the universal mind. At arriving at a point of consciousness where you have complete faith and trust that the infinite power of universal intelligence will deliver you to the image of your faith. Any subsequent attempt to direct your will at the circumstances that come your way is an imposition on the plan of universal intelligence. You are not bigger than God. Willing against the plan by which He is delivering your desires will abrogate that plan at once and set the power to moving in a different direction. Do not direct your will toward the physical world. It avails you nothing and in the end defeats you. However, there is one very important place for you to exercise will, and that is in your choke of thoughts. When you retreat into the center of consciousness, to the place where you become but an observer, you may will the type of thoughts that cross your consciousness. Here is the basis of the law of attraction. Whatever you will to think, you think. Whatever type of thought you choose is automatically attracted to you. It is therefore will which is the basis of the law of attraction. But will to think right only and not will to change the objects and circumstances of your physical world through thought power or physical action. Deliberately guard your thoughts. Deliberately choose to think only those thoughts which are in the image of your true desire. Refuse to accept any others. By this correct application of will on the mental plane, the outside world grows into the image of your desire. From the Dhammapada, all that we are is the result of what we have thought. It is founded on our thoughts. It is made of our thoughts. Let the wise man guard his thoughts. There is no fear in him while he is watchful. Attraction is mental choice. It is will to think right that attracts the proper thoughts. These thoughts move across your center of consciousness, are taken onto you and accepted. From that point, the law of creation is invoked, and whatever you have accepted will be created for you in the physical world. The law of attraction is neither more nor less than the law of attracting thoughts, and it is done by a process of choice. Whatever you choose to think, is sent to you from the limitless reaches of universal intelligence. These thoughts, once having been accepted by you, will manifest in the physical world. Willing to think the right thoughts is the basis of all accomplishment, all vigor, all success, all health, all happiness. It is from here, this point of first choice, that everything in the universe starts. It is first Cause, consciousness making a choice. It is the primal question of all creation. What will you think? Once the choice is made, your life is but a reflection of your thoughts made manifest. You choose every circumstance and thing about you in that first choice when you decide what you will think. Pascal says, Thought constitutes the greatness in man. Schopenhauer says, the world is my idea. The Vedanta philosophy of ancient India says that matter has no existence, independent of mental perception. 
Mind is the mighty mover. What will you think? The choice is yours and yours alone. The only true choice which you have in your life. Through it, all things will be delivered to you, for good or evil, according to your choice. For the mighty power of the universal subconscious mind will create in the physical world the image of your thought. Such is its law and its nature, and it can do nothing else. Heaven or hell are choices you make for yourself. The universal subconscious mind knows neither. It only answers your thought. The Path to Illumination Pascal says, All dignity lies in thought. By it we must elevate ourselves and not by space and time which we cannot fill. He says further, There are only two kinds of people who can be called reasonable. Those who serve God with all their heart because they know Him, and those who seek Him with all their heart because they do not know Him. The first man is both reasonable and happy. The second is reasonable and unhappy. But a man who neither knows God nor seeks Him is foolish as well as unhappy. Thus the greatest adventure in life is to come to know the universal subconscious mind for its infinite power and to learn how to use this power to fill our lives with good and abundance. At the end of such a path lies a magnificent spiritual awakening, a transfiguration, a key to life's mysteries, an understanding of the meaning of all things indwelling in God and God dwelling in all things. The key itself is only three words. Words which have no magic of themselves but contain such astounding significance that only a fully prepared mind may grasp it. You will do well to ponder on what this key might be. Search the quotation above for possible meanings and dwell on them during your meditation periods. When you retreat into your center of consciousness, illumination may come before the final chapter. It is sure to be yours at the end. Mind and Action Life is dynamic. All about you are the manifold evidences of nature's eternal process of becoming things. Nothing remains static. Wherever you look, your eyes see movement and flow and change. Birth and death are the rhythms by which nature reaches ever upward seeking, constantly seeking. No. Learn. Build. These inexorable commands issue from every bud, egg, flower, bush, tree, and a crescendo of evolving life. In view of this busy universe of ours, perhaps it seems strange that you are told that the path to power and accomplishment lies in getting your physical body quiet and working only with your mind. Perhaps like so many others, you feel you should thrust yourself into the midst of the fray. Take and grab and fight for what you want. When Jesus said, Those who take up the sword die by the sword, he wasn't talking about soldiers only. For whoever enters aggressively into life with the aim of taking by force or cleverness will find himself dealt with the same way. Since life is bigger than he, the final victor is obvious. Do not be concerned with action. Action is natural. Life and movement are synonymous. Concern yourself rather with guidance for your action. Know that all action springs from thought, that when your thought is true, so will your action be. Action which is governed solely by stimuli received from the outer world is false action and can result in nothing other than the frustration of your desires. You dissipate your energies. Every time you attack an obstacle or a circumstance as a purely physical thing, no man is big enough to do anything by himself. The most frantic of your energies cannot change a wave of the sea or the color of the grass or the spread of a tree. Man who made himself not, who knoweth himself not, who liveth among phantoms he knoweth not of, what imbecility possesses him that he should attempt to mold the world by force? Wherever he looks, he sees the work of the power greater than he is. He cannot fight this power. He can only attune 
himself to it, work in accord with it. Thus it is true action we are concerned with, not action for action's sake. True action springs from true thought, and true thought springs from man's cloistering himself in meditation with the universal subconscious mind. He who moves with God moves with power, and his action is rewarded. The great men of this world accomplished in an hour what other mortals accomplish in a year, yet they are not more active. Their activity is guided, powerful, sure, because they are directed to their objectives by the unlimited resources and power of the universal subconscious mind. To such men, lack and limitation and failure and disease are barely possible of understanding. They can scarcely conceive of them. The Legend of the Go-Getter This world of ours does not belong to the Go-Getter. It never has and it never will. The frantic man who throbs out his life chasing power or prestige or fame is assured of one thing only, bad health. The worlds he fights, he can never subdue. Ulcers eat holes in his stomach. Tired heart muscles give way. Taut nerves come unstrung. Nobody can beat the universe, and that is what the go-getter sets out to do. He cannot be successful because he is too vain. Having no humility, he does not know that all things are done by a mighty lord, an unknown sage that inhabits all places in all times. Without this knowledge, the go-getter is a molecule, vibrating and rebounding crazily in the limits he has imposed upon himself. He has no design to his life because he does not see the design of life itself. Disdain the life of a go-getter. Move with God, with dignity and surety. Give no thought to action, for thought produces action as naturally as light comes from the sun. All things are decided in the mind and all decisions are carried out by the invincible universal mind. There is only one life, one mind, one I, one self manifesting an infinite number of things and beings. According to your awareness, you approach the power of this self. Know that first cause is within. First decision is made by choosing which thoughts you will think. Whatever you think will manifest in your life. Think only positively. Refuse to accept negative circumstance as having any final reality. Keep your thoughts steadfast on the good. Maintain your image with the fuel of your faith, and you will discover a universe of limitless supply and limitless reward, constant adventure, and everlasting love. Know that every idea produces itself on the physical plane, in an effect exactly like the cause. Place no limits on your thinking. All things are possible. The moment they are considered probable, they become certainty. Space itself is only that which accommodates movement. Matter itself is only that which illustrates movement. Space and matter and movement are nothing more than intelligence working with, through, and upon itself. Everything is made of this intelligence. It becomes all things. It can become anything. The real you. Don't confuse what you seem to be with what you really are. To the real you, the indwelling self, the observer in the depths of our soul, nothing is impossible. Give heed to this dweller. Give him homage and respect and humility. Your body is his temple. Would you surround it with evil and disease and want and lack? And failure? Refuse to accept these limitations. There are illusions. The universe is all vigor and all health and all abundance. What you choose to accept and think you will see. What you seem to be is but the barest fraction of what you really are. Refuse to think of yourself as a name, as a holder of a job, as a person who resides in a certain town, in a certain country on a certain date as a person who has had a certain history. That is what you seem to be. In the solitude of a silent room, in a shaded glen, on a hillside, in a meadow, 
or on a crag overlooking the ocean. Turn your thoughts within to the real you. Slow your breathing until you feel complete peace and relaxation. Retreat into the depth of your being until your very thoughts are things to be observed. Ask yourself, who is this that observes? The real you is a mighty truth, a clarion call in the greatest age of man. Let the spiritual element rule your life. Give each of your problems to universal subconscious mind and listen for the answer. When the answer comes, accept it with complete confidence and faith. Do not allow negations to steal into your mind like thieves in the night, for they will rob you of the greatest treasures. Close your mind to evil, to all lack, to all limitation, to all disease. Into your consciousness come the most important of all things, your thoughts. They come not merely to visit you, they come to take root and make themselves known as the physical things of your life. Bar the door to all negation. Post a permanent sentinel in letters bold and black. None but the positive and the good shall enter here. And thus will your life be. Mutual exchange is the law. See the movement and flow of life as a great exchange between all beings. All things must be paid for. Mutual exchange is the law. You get because you give. You sell but only so you can buy. There is no such thing as independence. It is a hallucination of the most foolish sort. We are all dependent upon one another, for we are all component parts of a great whole. You cannot live without your neighbor, and he cannot live without you. What you contribute to him, he will return in measure to you. Perhaps the measure is money, perhaps not. But whether the price is in dollars, or pesos, or francs, or bushels, or quarts, the price is there still. And what you receive you must pay for, and what you contribute you will be rewarded for. There are no bargains. The exchange is always equal, regardless of how it may look at the moment. Retreat daily into communion with the universal subconscious mind. Find your center of consciousness in the quietness of your meditations. Only in this way can you truly know yourself for what you really are and thus absolve any confusion with what you seem to be. The knowledge of what you truly are is at the center of your consciousness, the I, the observer, the self, unto whom all things are possible. Slay the spirit of gravity. We mustn't pursue these studies with long faces and melancholy. Life is laughter and excitement and joy. Life is singing and dancing and fellowship. The melancholy mean and the grave countenance are never worth whatever wisdom they might produce. They defeat the God and man because they cannot laugh. Nietzsche says, Let us slay the spirit of gravity, not by wrath but by laughter. He who laughs is full of hope, but he whose countenance is stony has given way to despair and thus has defeated himself no matter what he has learned. This is an adventure, a great excitement that fills the heavens with its grandeur. The good news I bring you, said Jesus, is that the kingdom of heaven is within. Can we possibly be morose or melancholy on learning that the entire power of the universe dwells within each of us? Can there possibly be anything saddening? in learning that we can use this power to fill our lives with good and abundance. This is good news, big news, a news that calls for celebration, for singing, for dancing, for elation. The universe cradles us in everlasting arms. We are eternal, immortal, everlastingly one, and the nature of our true being will work for us here on earth even as it does in heaven. After this manner, pray ye. Let us, for the moment, transpose the Lord's Prayer into the language of this study, so that we may thoroughly understand what Jesus knew when he said, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. I know the universal subconscious mind dwells within me and is all-powerful. May the truth of this power be revealed to me, 
and may I work in accord with it, for it is perfect. There is no limit to abundance, and the universe will provide me with all that I need. I let go of vanity, and am not tempted into thinking evil through seeing evil. I know the real truth and the real power is within me, one, eternal, and everlasting. All things are made from universal intelligence. All things exist in universal intelligence. All form proceeds from thought, and thought is the first cause for all things. We are able to choose what we think, and once having chosen, nothing can stop our decisions from becoming real in the physical world. Thus the law of attraction is the law of choosing thoughts. Whatever we choose to think, we will think. And whatever we think becomes real in our lives. Choose to think calmly that which you really desire. Refuse to entertain any thoughts of what you fear. And you will find you are unerringly guided to your goals by a power greater than you are. Review 1. Every center of life force attracts those thought things that answer its mental vibrations. 2. Because we think and desire, we are praying every minute of our lives. 3. To alter your life, you must alter your thinking. 4. Every form and substance in the universe exudes a subtle attraction, powerful in proportion to awareness. 5. What man accepts, God creates. 6. Vanity is a sense of independent ego and isolates a man from universal subconscious mind. 7. Vanity breeds a sense of personal responsibility, and personal responsibility denies the power of the universal mind. 8. A human being has no personal responsibility other than for the thoughts he chooses to think. 9. He who lives by a doctrine of personal responsibility sees the entire universe as his foe. 10. He who lives by a doctrine of attunement sees the entire universe rushing to do his bidding. 11. Make your decisions in the mind and trust the universal mind to carry them out. Refuse to accept apparent delay and detour as anything other than the perfect path. 12. Don't predict the manner in which the universal mind should carry you to your goals. It has the knowledge of all things and all times and thus automatically knows the perfect path. The human being has only a limited knowledge of a certain place and a certain time, and thus, by himself, cannot know the perfect path. 13. Don't batter and rail against unwanted circumstances but let go and let God. Denying the power that guides you will leave you adrift with insurmountable problems. 14. A man by himself is a microbe. A man attuned to his inner self is a universe. 15. Mistakes are for learning and not to carry around with you as a burden. Refuse to accept guilt. God is in you and God is is not guilty. 16. Do not keep examining your goals when they are not yet attained. If you keep projecting lack of attainment into the universal subconscious mind, you can expect nothing else in return. 17. When you have created something on the plane of mind, you must know that it is done. Nothing can stop it from manifesting in the physical world. Keep your faith and conviction no matter the apparent obstacles. Look for opportunity in each obstacle. 18. The kingdom of heaven is the center of consciousness. Know it, and all things will be added unto you. 19. Action of itself produces nothing. Only true action creates, and true action springs from true thought. 20. The one place the human can exercise will is at the center of his consciousness, where he can will to think whatever he wishes. 21. 
Take more heed to your thought than to the world about you, for your thought brings the world about you. 22. In meditation, ponder the meaning of all things indwelling in God and God dwelling in all things. 23. Be not busy or in a hurry. There is nothing to fight and nobody to beat. There is only things to learn and awareness to be obtained. God moves with sureness. 24. Don't confuse what you seem to be with what you really are. You are never what you seem to be and always what you really are, which is within you, at the center of your consciousness. 25. Let the spiritual element rule every decision of your life. 26. Refuse to accept melancholy or sadness. The universe sings and dances. 27. Choose the thought. Once you accept it, the thing in its image will be yours. Spiritual Treatment Be sure that you successfully complete the 30-day mental diet. Only in this manner will you be able to completely demonstrate the power of positive thinking. Do not forget to seek your center of consciousness daily, just prior to your period of meditation. These procedures are living tools. Use them. Each of the meditations in this book are spiritual treatments aimed at bringing your life into harmony with good, into harmony with the power of the universal subconscious mind. You may use these meditations to give spiritual treatments to your friends or loved ones or to anyone you wish to help. Simply substitute he or she or the person's name where I is used in the text and you will shortly make demonstrations. Our prompters are lulled when we give a treatment to someone else, and very often we are able to demonstrate for them before we are able to demonstrate for ourselves. Don't hesitate to tackle any of the problems of your friends or loved ones, but do not confide that you are treating for them. The wise man doeth his alms in secret. Recommended Reading Thought Power by Annie Besant.